to visit all of you and came to share with you about my journey. I think you all know the Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. And you know that in that Christmas Carol, there is a prediction of three ghosts. The ghosts of Christmas past, Christmas present, and Christmas future. And I shared with you that my business partner, Jacob Marley, came to me and predicted and told me that these ghosts will appear. And last Sunday, I shared with you about the ghosts of Christmas past. And we heard that it is painful to deal with our past. We heard that sometimes when we don't let our past go, it's hard for us to experience the present. And so as I have, was left by the Christmas, the ghosts of Christmas past, now we come to the ghosts of Christmas past. Present. And the ghost of Christmas present is to show me things today, to show me how I may view life differently, to show me that I can have a greater appreciation for the things that are around me. And so he began to take me through the town, our town. And as he led me through this town, I first saw the people who had much wealth. But then he quickly lead to a, a section of the town that was all the poor. And as I walked through the town, I saw people shoveling snow, working in their shops, but something different I saw for the very first time. I saw that the people who were shoveling snow were happy and joyful. I saw that the people that worked in their shops were, were, were filled with glee. And I began to wonder, how could people who have so little possessions, how can they have such joy and such glee? How can they embrace these things when there's so much that they do not have? And so, so the ghost of Christmas present led me through the life as it is, as I began to see with different eyes. And I began to realize that there was something more to Christmas than just money and keeping a ledger and account of things. I began to realize that when I thought about the Christmas story, that it wasn't just about the presents and the gifts, but it was much, much more. It was about God and God's Son. It was about that how peace is the proof of hope. And it was about how hope is connected to peace, and peace is rooted to love. And what greater love can there be that God would send God's only Son to be among us? And not only to be among us, but to be among us vulnerable human beings. For example, there's a story that talks about when the mother took the boy Jesus to the temple. And as they were heading back home, and after a day's journey, they finally realized, uh oh, we left the boy back in Jerusalem. Definitely first time parents, right? <laughs> and so this child that has come into the world is a child that comes in the midst of us with all our vulnerabilities. Now think of it this way, I'm from the 1800s in England, and we don't have what you have which are called movies, right? And do you remember the movie Elf? And in the movie Elf, Will Ferrell plays a human being. And Will Ferrell is raised by elves. Do you remember the movie Jungle Book? Remember the name of the boy, Mowgli? And who was Mowgli raised by? Animals. And God sent God's son to be raised by humans. Sometimes we're more like animals than we are elves, right? Sometimes it's hard to get past our vulnerabilities. We let our vulnerabilities get the best of us. But God decided that he would take the chance and sent his only son in our midst and let his only son experience human beings and all their vulnerabilities. And as a child, as a baby, does Christ child refuse to forego the vulnerabilities? Now you might be saying to yourself, how oh, could the Christ child have vulnerabilities? The vulnerabilities lie in his senses. The senses of smell and, and taste, hearing and touch. And 
so we come to understand that the Christ child had eyes to cry. That the Christ child had ears to hear people's pain and anger. The Christ child had hands to touch the sacred scroll and hands to heal a woman who was hemorrhaging or a blind man. And so the vulnerabilities that was placed upon him, he took those vulnerabilities and used them for good. Used it to let people know that he's here to love us and here to be among us and with us. And if you think about it, this Christ child that comes, the name that's given to him in the Gospel of Matthew is Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. God with us. Now, my senses came alive when the ghost of Christmas present continued on this journey of looking at the poor. And it came alive when he showed me that underneath his coat, and if you remember the, the movie, he was a, a very tall, big, gigantic type of man. And as he opened up his coat, there were two children underneath. One called ignorance, and the other called want. And he told me, Scrooge, these are your children. And I gotta be honest with you, it about scared the Charles Dickens out of me when I saw those kids. But it opened my eyes. It opened my eyes to realize that those who have very little can be very thankful. Those who barely have enough to eat every day seem to have a greater faith than those who have too much. And you know it's about having too much, right? I read in your newspaper while I was here just this past week something called Cyber Monday. Did you know that we made a new record that on Cyber Monday, $9.4 billion, a new record, was used to make purchases online, the most ever in our history. You know, my question is, what's online? What is that? We don't have such a thing. Is that, is that a closed line you put your laundry on? Then and also the newspaper article, your newspaper article said that in the five-day Thanksgiving shopping spree, that 89 million Americans went shopping. Incredible. Incredible. And they bought, and they bought, and they bought. Now, to be honest, all I really care about is not so much how much you buy, but can you pay for it? And so I keep this legend, and I keep track of it. That's my job. I write down who has paid, who has not paid. This is my naughty and nice list. And that's how I keep track. That's what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about my stuff. Nobody else's stuff, but my stuff. But then I realized maybe that's part of my problem. Maybe that may be part of all of your problems. That we worry too much about stuff. That if we're truly going to celebrate Christmas, we should celebrate the spirit of Christmas. Not a contest of who's able to buy the most presents. And we should focus on the spirit of Christmas by what we give and what we do during this Advent and Christmas time. That is truly, truly what I think, and I'm coming to learn now, what Christmas is about. It's about what we do, how we help others. Now, you're saying, well, well, not everybody's close to God. Not everybody has this experience. Not everybody feels that Christmas is very sacred or holy. But let me remind you that God has this knack of coming to people who are most unworthy, unlikely. And I have to ask myself, the three ghosts, past, present, and future to come, is God working through them to show me a different way to live? Is God showing me that I can change my ways? Is God showing me that I can be transformed from the Scrooge that's inside me and maybe inside of you? So that we're more aware that there are people around us who do not have a whole lot. It was pointed out by one of your writers of your day that possibly, possibly, 
The loaf of bread that's on your counter that's starting to get stale is a loaf of bread for the hungry. That the clothes on the back side of your closet are clothes for the naked. And that possibly everything else that you do not use, like shoes. We all got that one pair of shoes that we never wear, right? Could they not be shoes for those who are barefoot? And so the question is not so much how we decorate and design our Christmases, but it's about what we do with what we have. And do we truly speak of the true spirit of Christmas? So in the scriptures that you have in your few Bibles, there is a person, a character, if you will, that's called the shepherd. And the shepherd is where the angels came to make the great announcement that God is coming in Christ Jesus. It is the shepherd who is poor and do not have the means to spread such grandiose news. And you have to ask yourself, okay, why would God choose to come to the lowly shepherd? Because they live simple lives. They don't have distractions. They have very little. And they already have God within them. And so when God comes to the shepherd to share this wonderful news, it should not surprise us that he called and came to the Lord. Look at Mary, mother of Jesus in Luke 147. She describes herself as the lowliest of servants. So we have to ask ourselves, is our life filled with too many distractions? Or do we keep it simple enough, thankful enough? That we're able to see the blessings of every day. Are we able to see God when God appears? And I think one of the reason that God chose the poor and the shepherd is because God was already there. So I ask you, who are you waiting to appear in your life? Who are you waiting to come upon your doorsteps? I hear that you have somebody or people called porch pirates. Porch pirates. In a recent survey it says that 36% of Americans that were surveyed shared that at least once they had stolen goods from their porch. And 50% of those who were surveyed said that they're going to stay home when their package comes because they don't want anybody taking their stuff. You see where that's taken us? The focus, once again, is our stuff. It's not on the spirit of Christmas. It's not on what we can do to help others. It's on our stuff. And when we focus on our stuff, we get ourselves off track. We, we take on a, a perspective that we're not meant to have. And it's a perspective that focuses on what is visible and not what's, what's unseen. And so I ask all of you to consider Consider that as you look at all the goods and the goodies of Christmas, know that there are those who are without. Know there are those who may not be as fortunate as we all are. Know that we're called upon to not focus on the truth, but focus on the spirit of the Christ child. And so as you reflect on the renamed, what we were so, but until we have a Christmas, ask yourself, as I celebrate Advent and Christmas, and Advent being the four weeks prior to Christmas, do I worry too much about what I want and not more willing to accept to get just what I need? Is it possible that we're expecting too much when there are others who know how to expect anything because they've never had anything. And so that asks that you consider through the lessons that I am learning through this Christmas carol journey with the three goats, that you look at your own practices, your own traditions, and that maybe our celebration should be in moderation in respect out of those who are poor and have nothing. Now, I know having just said that, we're probably going to say either bah humbug. Can you say bah humbug? Bah Or you're going to say amen? Amen. So if you respect those by watching yourselves, knowing that in the middle of your glee and glorious Christmas traditions and celebrations, take time out to remember those who have not. 
And if you take time out to remember those who have not, I think you'll find yourself saying, Amen. Can you say amen? Amen. amen? amen. So where am I now? The ghost of Christmas present has left me 